have a very special guest today. This is Maria, and we're going to be hearing her story. She is from Brazil, and I have had the pleasure of talking with her a few times um, off the channel and podcast, <laughs> and um, I'm really excited to introduce her to you guys. She is awesome. And so I will stop talking so she can introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I am Maria. I am 27. I am from Brazil, as Brooke said. And my Turner syndrome story uh, started like when I was five years old. It was when I was diagnosed. And my mother and my father, they saw uh, that I was I'm much shorter than my classmates at kindergarten. So they start getting worried about it because like my classmates was were getting higher and I was like at the same height. So my mother asked my pediatrician a few times, like, is everything all right? Is this normal? And he said, no, it, it is normal. You, uh, you two are not uh, tall, so she's not going to be tall. But after like some months, he, he told, okay, uh, go to an endo and do some testing. And then uh, they, the endo asked my parents to do a karyotype, but the endo said, no, probably is nothing. She's perfect, perfectly normal. And then uh, when the karyotype come and it was like Turner syndrome on it, even the doctor was surprised because he didn't expect that. And it happened because uh, I, although I am classic, I wasn't born with any symptoms. Like I didn't have web neck or puffed hands or feet. Uh, I didn't have heart problems and nothing like that. So not even ear infections. So uh, it was a surprise for everybody. Yeah, wow, that just, oh man, it's such, it's a great example of you never know how it's going to manifest. You never know how it's going to show up. Yes, and like even uh, that was the first endo that I went. And uh, when I switched endos, because I had a few experiences like this first one, um, he didn't know how to deal with Turner syndrome. My mother was so insecure about what he, he said. And she and my, my father, they took me to another anthropologist. And then this one uh, was the one that um, established my treatment up to date when I was 18. And then I had switch. And the, my endocrinologist now, she was like, okay, you are classic and like, you didn't have any symptoms at all. And yes, <laughs> like um, it was like that. And one thing that is interesting is um, I had these experiences with so many doctors because I am from a small city here in, in Brazil. And like in my town, there is no specialist. So my treatment is on the state capital. So I have to travel three, four hours to go to my appointments. Wow. Has there been any availability of like doing online calls like this for any of that? Uh, now with the pandemic, um, we are working on it, but uh, up to now, no. Especially because like uh, when I was little, like um, I had growth hormone shots and uh, as I was not uh, like, I was like seven when I started growth hormone shots. So the dose, it, it switched a lot. So I had to go to the endocrinologist like um, four times a year because of it. So it was really difficult, especially because she had to see my height, my weight, um, my heartbeat, my blood pressure. So uh, just now with the pandemic, we are working on video calls. But besides that, I always travel and go there. Yeah, well, I think that's awesome that you found one that 
you can work really well with? Has that been something that, well, I, I guess I'm wondering how common the knowledge of Turner syndrome is in Brazil. Well, uh, I although I don't have this kind of information, I know that in big cities, it's more common. I know that in Sao Paulo, it's the biggest city of Brazil. They have a hospital that has a center for Turner syndrome. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Groups. Yes, and they have uh, many specialists, not just anthropologists, they have cardiologists and other doctors. Um, I know in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, they have a hospital that has this kind of group. But I, I know it's more like um, in big cities. Um, I know, I don't know many roles here in Brazil with Turner syndrome, but the ones I know, the treatment is like always in big cities. I was lucky because um, the doctor that treated me when I was a kid, she was like one of the biggest doctors in Turner syndrome here in Brazil. Like um, here, the government, they have like guidelines for each syndrome and each kind of disease. And she was the doctor that created the guidelines for Turner syndrome, the first one. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I discovered it like a few months ago, <laughs> but it was really cool to know that. Yeah, that's really cool. That's, that is, always something that I, I've had a couple of doctors that have been in like similar positions where they've they've been pretty enveloped in the community and everything and that's always been encouraging to know <laughs> yes especially because I had like every time I go to medical exams they were like okay why why are you doing this exam oh I have Turner syndrome what's that again <laughs> Every time I go to like um, uh, when to see my bones, to see my ovaries and things like that, like what is Turner syndrome again? So yeah. <laughs> that's always uh, I I always am thrown off when I hear that. Still, <laughs> I haven't I haven't heard it. it overwhelming amount but it's always a moment where you're like wait what okay but the most shocking part of it it was the first time that my doctor asked me to see my my ovaries to know how are they are they normal or are they like high stripe okay and i went to the exam and the doctor uh, oh, okay, what's Turner syndrome? Okay, I explained it. And she was like, oh, you have no ovaries. And I was like, okay. When I went to my doctor, she told me, no, you have ovaries. They are there. They are so small, but they are there. This doctor that uh, did your exam was wrong. They are there. They are tiny, but yeah, like they don't know how to deal with it yeah that would be oh man that would be a little overwhelming to go back and forth on that totally it's like every time he's a different star we a different doctor and have to explain all over again yeah i i think the most interesting part of that for me is always trying to explain it in a way because when I tell friends it's a lot different they're not they're not treating me they're not helping me with the health complications how have you what has been the way you've explained it has there been a specific way you've explained it when they've asked you uh I generally give like the basic information especially depending on the exam. For example, um, if, it, if it is a bone exam, I say, okay, uh, I have Turner syndrome. It's like when we don't have, we have a total or partially missing chromosome 
and related bones, uh, I can have calcium problems and it can affect my bones. This is why I am doing this exam. Like uh, when it is like my ovaries, it's like the same introduction, <laughs> Turner syndrome. I have a total or partially missing X chromosome and I, my ovaries can be tiny and I cannot have kids. So depends on the exam. I like that. I think, I think that might have been, the, there's one big time that I've had to explain it to a doctor that sticks out in my head. And that was when I was going in because I thought I had ear infections. And I'm pretty sure I did something similar where I kind of gave a little general of this is what it is. And because of it, I get a lot of ear infections. So I, I want to make sure. And um, yeah, it just giving that context. I don't know, it, it feels it feels so it's important and it's it's kind of like a okay I hope this is <laughs> I hope this is everything you need or that will help yes it's like um you have to give a lot of context um I know that for example the doctor that I am uh, with now she says okay Turner syndrome is not so uncommon if you research, there is a, a lot of information about it, but it's like just the doctors that treat that know. The other specialists, they don't research or they don't know how to deal with it. They, they just have like the information that they learn at the medical school. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you are like this, like in a box. And it is not like that. Like it depends of each case. So you have to know what it is, but you have to know it can have a lot of variations and complex it and it is complex. Yes, yes. I think that is the biggest piece of improving or furthering the understanding and treatments is having that awareness be greater, where it's not just a, this is what Turner syndrome is, but this is all the different ways it can manifest. These are all of the different ways it's manifested already hearing our stories. So they know, oh, you can't put this in. I like the little box thing. I love that picture for it. You can't put this in a little box. That's not, that's not how it works. And I think everything I've seen where doctors have maybe missed the mark has been from things like that, where they, they tried to keep it in a little box or see it that way. Yes, it, this is the thing. Um, and one thing that uh, I think it's important and it's something that I really enjoy your channel is like you can um, help us understand what is happening because it is important for us that have Turner syndrome to know what is happening with our bodies. Like um, one interesting story of my life is that after I knew the diagnosis, I had that time of denying it. I was not super cool with having Turner syndrome. It was a kind of a process. And after some years, when I started learning about it, I discovered that I could have some hearing loss. And it was, and like I was like 21, 22. And since I was 17, I discovered that on my left ear, I was I, having some hearing loss, but I didn't know it was related with Turner's. So when I discovered that, I went to my doctor and I was like, oh, I know that I have some hearing loss. I feel it. And she's like, okay, uh, let's go to the doctor, see some exams to see. And then I did the exam and it was like, okay, you have hearing loss. It is not a big one. It is a small one, but it is related with Turner syndrome. So 
I didn't know, and maybe I wasn't having the right uh, treatment, not treatment because I don't do nothing because it's so small, but me, me, now I know I have to check it regularly because I know it can get worse with time. Yes. Yeah. Even if it's something that never manifests, like the heart issue is the biggest thing I think that I advocate for. Even if you've never had issues in the past, even if you don't feel any symptoms, especially not writing off because you don't feel any symptoms, but just even if you don't think it's that big of a concern, that is another thing that you want to make sure of. And knowing that is super important. Just knowing that you should be paying attention to it and checking on it. Yes, it's like paying attention, checking, and um, know the, how your body talks. Because I, I truly believe that if something is wrong, our body always shows some, some symptoms, even the slightest, even the shortest ones. So uh, I like that. Uh, and uh, I think the heart problems is something that I am really afraid of having. <laughs> it is probably the most overwhelming one to think about um because it's a very different concern from infertility where it's more of an emotional process um so it's oh man the the heart issue and there's been so many stories of things being caught when there hadn't been any issues and just they were doing their normal and all of a sudden things had changed and it's like oh okay yes it really it really is important to stay on top of yes like uh when i was diagnosed i was like that many kind of exams i had i had to do yeah. and uh, my heart is perfectly normal up to now but although the medical guidelines say oh you have to check it every five years i check it every two years <laughs> i always like i uh, every two years i tell i tell my doctor oh it's time to check the, my heart <laughs> so let's do some exams i am this kind of person yeah yeah for <sighs> For a decent amount of time, I was getting them more frequently than five years. Um, and so when I saw five years, that kind of threw me off. I'm like, that does not, that yes. feels like I didn't wait that long. But then me and my mom were talking the other day and she was like, no, I think it was every five years. It was, we had this routine where it was like every six months I would go see my endo. And at the time frame that it was time to go do all of those screenings again, as the appointment was closing, she go, okay, so now I'm gonna go send you down to do all of the testing that we need to do. It's time again. So it was a routine every time it was that it was, I had my appointment with her and then I went and did it. And um, I guess I got so into a routine, I didn't even notice how frequently it was actually happening. It just felt like it was consistent. Yes, uh, and this is a kind of some, uh, something that I like to do, like a routine with my exams, with my medicine. I like to establish this routine. It works for me. I think it's so simple and it's, some, it's something that makes me like control what is happening. Yeah, it gives you, you feel like you have a little bit of a say in what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, totally and is. for me, it makes it easier to remember. <laughs> also, like uh, I, I have an alarm to know the time to take my medicine, so I will not forget. It's like my cell phone rings and okay, it's time for the medicine. Same like this, because <laughs> not doing that is how. Because I had a time period where I was admittedly awful at being good with my medicine. And I feel the difference. I don't know about you, but I feel a significant difference if I let myself get off track with it. So I started setting an alarm and it's a running joke with me and my mom. Cause she's like, if you didn't have that, oh gosh, I would just completely forget. 
<laughs> yes, um, like uh, I didn't have this problem of not taking my medicine because um, the first one, the first medicine that I took, it was for thyroid. Thyroid, I have hypothyroidism, okay. and it was like uh, it was the first thing that we started after the diagnosis. It was like the only number that it was not good on the blood work. So I, I clearly remember I was six and my father gave me like the, um, the box of the medicine and he, he was like, you have to, to, to take one of these every day. Don't forget because it's important for your health. I don't know if it was because I was a kid. I was so impacted, like yeah. it's important for your health. I got stick to it and okay, I know I have to take it. So uh, my thyroid medicine is okay. But for the HRT, it was, uh, I had so many experience with, with it because I started with a patch and a tablet, mm -hmm. uh, a patch of estrogen and a tablet of progesterone. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, it was, I was okay with it. But after 10 years, uh, they stopped producing their progesterone. Mm -hmm. And it was a journey. Like, it was so difficult to find another way that my body felt okay and my exams exams were okay it was like i in two years i took like five different medicines because they weren't working and it was like every time every day talking with my doctor to check and she was like how is it going and it now i am okay with the one i am taking i am on birth control now but it it was like so difficult to find another way because it like the one I was taking, it was perfect. Even the doctors was like, how can your body still works with this medicine even 10 years after it? It was like perfect. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so I have to adjust it. And finally, I am okay now. That's good. Yeah, oh man, HRT can be such a journey to figure out all the different aspects of it and making sure all of those different things work. Yes, and it's not like just, oh, um, are you having a periods and the number on the exams are okay, but it's about how you feel. I have one that I took that I felt terrible, like tired uh, with cramps. I was like, it was a terrible experience. And this, and like, even my ex, even though my exams were okay, like my doctor and I talked and it was like, no, it's not okay for you. So let's stop and change again. Yeah. Just listening to how it makes you feel is so important. So you said your levels looked okay. So was there any concern about you not getting enough of it or was it all about, um, it was kind of just impacting you differently. It was impacting me. It was like, a, um, it was impacting on the way of how I was living because um, the amount of hormones were okay, but my body was not uh, dealing great with it, with it. Like all the side effects that were described on the medicine I was having, like uh, feeling tired and having spots of, uh, before my period and feeling with pain, like all of these was, uh, were happening. So this is the reason I changed it. Well, that's so good. You were able to find one that worked better. Thank God. <laughs> Although it was a journey, it was like a difficult path to find one. It was okay. I'm okay now with it. That's good. Yeah. Pushing through and just keeping going with trying different ones and trying to find it can be so worth it. Because I know I feel so much better 
after having gone through that myself. Yes, me too. Totally, like a lot better. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest ways that Turner's impacts your life right now? Um, no, um, I can say that now I am okay, but the biggest issue that I had, it was with my height. Like I know that for most of uh, girls that are infertility, but I am pretty small. Like even though with the growth hormone, I am for eight. So I am pretty small and because of my height, uh, I was bullied at school. And I know that some, sometimes when I go to places like, people look at me differently because I am small. So uh, this is the biggest way that impacted me. Now I am okay. Uh, I can't, I, I don't know if because I'm not at the point of thinking about having kids, but now I am, I am okay. And I think I am okay with, infer with infertility because I always thought about adopting. It was always an option, even before I knew about Turner syndrome. Um, I always thought about adopting and giving a home for a child that does not have one. So I think this is the reason why I am, it was not always like that. <laughs> like um, when my parents told me you have Turner syndrome, the first thing that I thought was I cannot have kids. And I started crying at that time, but now I am okay. So I can say the height is the one that impacted me the most. Yeah, that's, oh man, I, I think sometimes it's, for me, it's easy to forget the way that that has changed how I do things, but it, it really has, because I've, over my life, I've learned little tricks for being able to get stuff off a top shelf without needing help. Um, I used to steal the, so we had by our fireplace when I was growing up, we had the set of the different fireplace tools that had like the stick, it had a shovel, it had the clamps and I would like steal the clamps and use that to grab stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, I always find ways like uh, going up a chair or a table or things like that. But I think it was because of the bullying that it oh, yeah. impacted me the most. It was like a big part of my experience at elementary school. And high school was kind of better. But elementary school, it was like terrible for me. And uh, like the only thing that people can see that I am different is my height. So my classmates uh, give me nicknames and made some jokes because of it. So I think it was kind, it was because of this experience that I can say it was the height. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's, there's different times where I felt like I've been treated differently because of it. And there's always the multitude of short jokes that get thrown your way. And when somebody really wants to hurt you, that's the first thing that seems to come to people's minds. Um, and I, I think for me, it was always like, okay, I can handle a little bit. Like the short jokes, okay. I know, I know there's so many of them, okay. And then after a little bit, it kind of just like, okay, but I'm kind of I'm I'm done hearing them. Like, like I was a good sport and now I'm kind of over hearing them. And it just kind of wore on you after a while. Yeah, in my situation, uh, it was like at the be at the beginning, okay, but I have like a group of classmates that 
were making jokes. It was not like one or two. It was like four, five of them make jokes every day because of my height. So at some point, it was so tiring to, to hear that. And it was not like then. I really remember one time that uh, it was like um, break time and I was going out of my classroom and like it was my classroom and the classroom of the next year, the year I had mine, it was like next to mine. And I was walking and I passed it through like some boys of the this other uh, classroom and they started making jokes at me. They don't, they didn't even know me. They weren't my classmates. The, it was like the first or second time that they saw me and they start making jokes just because I was small. So this was the kind of situation that uh, I dealt with when I was a child. So at some point uh, it was frustrating, yeah. but it I can say with time I started to understand better what happened with me and now I now I don't have any problems at all but at that time it was not good I can say that yeah especially adding something like that on top of already feeling off and different especially for that, you know, that's one of the ways you feel different and they zero in on it because yes. it's, it's evident. Yes. And I can say that uh, it was not just my classmates. Uh, I, the worst experience that I had with bullying, it was like when I was on my senior year at high school and like here in Brazil, the senior year is like uh, when we learn about genetics at school. And when we were learning about Turner syndrome, the teacher, like it was like um, a group work, like the students, they worked on a presentation and they talked about the syndrome or the genetic problem. And when it was Turner syndrome, like the group presented and the teacher, he was like, uh, oh, can you take back to that picture? And the girls put the picture, like that traditional picture of Turner syndrome that we see on the internet. That's and really it scary doesn't, one. yes, <laughs> and that one, and he, uh, he pointed to the picture and he asked, see that girl who we want to marry that girl yes he said that in front of the class they didn't know that i have turner syndrome not my teacher and not my just and not my classmates just my friends knew and my friends look at look at me but it was just like that because oh. nobody knew. And at that time, I wasn't comfortable enough talking about it. Yeah. So I was quiet, uh, but I, it was the situation that I felt horrible. It was the one that hurt me the most. Yeah. And it was the one that, um, the worst one. I can, I can say that it was the worst one. Yeah. I'm so sorry. That's, oh man, that would be awful. I, I've had experience. I have my own experience of being like being in class and that's, that's now what we're talking about and the teacher getting information wrong, but nothing in the way of that nothing nothing no comments like that it was more she got the information wrong yes what uh, surprised me it was the comment like yeah and, and um when i arrived home i told my parents and at that time they decided not to go to school 
because they didn't want to expose me. Like nobody knew. And like uh, my, uh, my other teachers never treated me differently. I was like a perfect normal student. I didn't need any help with any classes. So I was perfectly normal in talking about being a student and my grades and everything. So my parents never, never felt the need to talk to my teachers about Turner syndrome. So yeah. nobody knew and they like, okay, if they thought that if they went to school and say what the teacher told, they were going to expose me. And I read suffered a lot, so they prefer not to expose me more. Yeah. Yeah, I think just with never knowing what can come out of people when they're in a situation that they don't understand something like that. That's part of why I heavily controlled who I told that I had it. I don't, I don't know if you had that same thing, but I was very conscious of who I told. I was very careful with it and for a long time, I didn't talk about it. Me too. Um, after my parents told me my diagnosis, uh, just my closest friends knew. Like I had a small group of friends and I just told them. And for a long time, it was like that. It was just like um, maybe 2015, maybe that. Uh, I started feeling okay and start and started uh, talking openly about it. Like, uh, of course, I'm not a person. Okay, I have Turner syndrome. Hello, <laughs> but uh, if the person starts to talk with me, I am the kind of person that is going at some point telling that I have Turner syndrome. But it's not like I barely know you and I'm going to talk. No. It's for people that uh, I know. Yeah, and people that you trust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, oh man, it's, it for that reason, it took me a while to be open to sharing. <laughs> um, I know I've talked to you about this. Um, so was there, was there any particular thing that kind of shifted for you and maybe made you feel a little more comfortable talking about it a little more? I don't say yes. <laughs> um, I can't remember the year, but um, I, I read a book and there was a, a quote on the book that it was like that, um, if you don't know people like you, you are never go. You are never going to know who you are, and people are never going to know who you are. And it it is a kind of that. It's not exactly this, and it changed me a lot because I understood three things with that. That one, I need to know other roles with Turner syndrome. Because at that point, I didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. The second one, it was like, I need to research more because I barely, uh, at that time, I barely knew what Turner syndrome is. I, I knew the basic stuff. But, and the third one, it was like, okay, if I want to feel more comfortable, I need to start talking about it. So this was like the, shifting point for me. I like that a lot. I think um, what really struck me the most of that quote was the whole idea of if you don't, if you aren't as open, nobody else is going to really fully know you. And that's important because I, I make a very distinct line between Turner's being 
a part of you versus Turner's being your identity. But yeah. it really is a piece of you that you can't have it and not be impacted in some way. And I, I mean, yes, there's the health complications impacts, but just who you are, your your personality, your perspective on things. And that's such a, I don't know, that's such a big piece of how I feel like it impacts me. So if somebody I was close to didn't know, they really wouldn't know me very well. Yes. Uh, I am like an advocate of the idea that Turner syndrome is not a limitation. It is a part of you, but it does not define you. Yes. I am a huge advocate of that. Like um, I always, I always think that Turner syndrome never stopped me doing whatever I wanted. But yes, it's a part of who I am. Not because like I have to go to doctors, but because Turner syndrome can impact uh, our mental health. And sometimes even the way that we deal with things and see the world. I, I understand that. So I think that um, it's not a limitation. It not defines who you are, your value, or your personality, but it is important. Uh, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's something that I think your your mindset can shift so much when you learn to embrace that as a part of you instead of feeling like it holds you back or like it's deciding things for you. Yes, and um, the one that I told you that when I read the book, it was the shifting point, but I have to say it has a point that I materialized it like uh, this this idea that it is with my PhD research because it was uh, of course the my research is not about me it's about Turner syndrome but it was the first time that I was able to talk about it openly so uh, when I presented my research to my classmates I had to explain why I was talking about Turner syndrome. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I uh, uh, write the first piece of text of my research to hand in to my professors, I had to explain, okay, I have, a Turner, I have Turner syndrome. It is not a limitation and my research is not going to lose the scientific part of it because I have, but I want to research it for any reasons. And one of the reasons is because I have certain syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. That, that passion behind it is so powerful when you're working on such a big project like that. Okay. Now I want to talk about your PhD research because I'm so excited about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. So share if you would, a little bit about what your PhD project is about. Okay, uh, my PhD project is about the communica communication of experiences of turning syndrome, girls, women, and their families on digital platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So um, my idea is to analyze um, how these girls and women with Turner syndrome and their families, they construct material and share on the internet. And what these materials say about Turner syndrome? Because what I discovered is like, it is so different from what the medical books and medical website says. So uh, my, my research is showing that through this experience in digital platforms, we can have a new configuration of Turner syndrome. So like uh, the perspective that I am showing is like communication can 
and the uh, end with the stigma with Turner syndrome can uh, shift the idea that the patients with Turner syndrome have about Turner syndrome can change the relationship and the interaction between these these women and always and also can create new meanings for Turner syndrome. It's a little bit complex, but I think that it's kind of it that I am researching. I love it. I love it so much. Um, it's such a great aspect of things to look at because, I mean, obviously, particularly with what I do on my channel, I think I just get so excited when I look at us having a piece to telling our own stories, um, you know, in especially in comparison to what the medical community might share. So what would you say is the biggest thing you noticed when comparing what the medical community shares and what girls and women with Turner's share? Have you noticed a particular difference? Uh, what I noticed is like, um, medical community, they generally show general information about Turner syndrome. They are not focused on the experiences. They are just focused on the biological aspect. And the main difference is like, when they talk about Turner syndrome, they talk about every symptom. And it was like, your kid or you can show all of the symptoms. And when we look about the patient perspective or the parent's perspective, especially on digital platforms that we have many possibilities of sharing, uh, it is more focused on the diversity of experiences. It is like, oh, my, I have this, my daughter has this, and it is an interaction in the way that they construct Turner syndrome as a collective thing, mm -hmm. not just like an individual, it more a social thing. It was not uh, isolated like in the medical community. Yeah, yeah, and I love I that particular difference of instead of here's all of the things that are possible, shifting to this is what's actually happening for me or in this particular case, I think could be so impactful with understanding things better. Yes. And um, when uh, you look for uh, like what the people comment or what the people do with this information, we see that they are willing to share. It is more like a way of releasing all the emotions and all the feelings that sometimes you have related with Turner syndrome. So it is also a way of constructing yourself, like when you share this experience on social media. Yeah, and kind of a way of processing all of it, I bet. I know for me, at least. Yes, it is like the things that uh, I am discovering uh, a little bit. Uh, yes, my, my research is in the middle of the process. It is in, under construction, but it, it is like these ideas that I am seeing when we, we analyze what's happening and the different things that can happen on social media, especially when you have a rare disease. Yeah, and um, one that to me, and I think I mentioned this to you before, it feels more rare than it actually is. So the numbers are probably as accurate as they can be as far as how often it occurs, but I think there's such a greater feeling of rarity than actually happens. Um, I, I think... I think part of that is people sharing. I have the same feeling. Like uh, after I started uh, researching, 
I found like a huge community, like people from different countries and with different experiences. Uh, I think that this number is like underestimate. Like uh, I think it happens more frequently than we think. Yeah, especially when it can manifest in such different ways. Somebody could be almost no symptoms at all. Yes. And still have it. Yes, uh, I totally agree. And oh, and there is one another thing that I discovered with my research that um, the main idea that the people have when they are sharing is to raise awareness is to uh, make people understand what Turner syndrome is and uh, to show like, oh, pay attention to the symptoms and maybe go to the doctor and see if you have or not, just to have more an accurate number. I think this is the biggest difference because one thing that um, it was like, what pushed me into this research, it was like, here in Brazil, we saw other syndromes and other health issues have a lot of uh, campaigns and they, if you turn in, if you turn on a news channel, you see they talking about this kind of health issues, but about Turner syndrome, no. And uh, I was like, okay, but people have it. And some people are diagnosed and don't know what it is. So I was like, okay, where are these people? These people that have Turner syndrome and what kind of communication they do? This is what pushed me into the research. So I, I, I think that the most important thing is to make Turner syndrome known by other people. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing that ends up pushing a lot of people to sharing online particularly is to help others. The best way I can describe it is to have at least heard the word before. Yes. And one thing that is so interesting about the communication, like when I was diagnosed, there was like internet, it was just the beginning of internet. And here in Brazil, imagine, it was like almost nothing uh, related to the internet. So uh, when uh, some, time, some years after I was diagnosed, I know that my parents, they helped uh, other two families that their daughter had has Turner syndrome and they got the diagnosis and they didn't know what it is. So I know that they called my parents and my parents helped them. So it's like, it is building a community. It is trying to communicate and help others. So I, I believe it is the main thing that communication can help us. Yes, yeah. And I think, oh man, just if all of the stories that are shared can give context to the medical sites and what the medical sites say, not that the medical sites have bad information, but I think it's information that is most helped by context. Yes. And that is what I love about having so many stories available online, particularly definitely more than when I was diagnosed my parents just had the medical books with the scary pictures and you know the doctor was like she's not gonna look like this they're like okay so what is she gonna look like then? <laughs> like what can we expect then yes it uh it was the same with my parents like the first one the first doctor that told my parents that to not feel worried it was like the geneticist that helped my parents. Um, they, he, uh, he said my parents, forget that she has Turner syndrome. She's going to have a normal life. Just go to the doctor, do the exams and go to the appointments, but she will have a completely normal life. It was the first doctor that told my parents this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, 
that's an important reminder to like focus on what's happening with her and that's what is best going to help her yes like my, my mother she uh, she told that this geneticist he interviewed me like alone in his office just to see how i was like how Turner syndrome impacted me up to that time, like I was five years old. And after this interview, he's, he told my parents that, okay, she's perfect, normal, just go to the doctor and it's this, but she's okay. Yeah, I think, and one of the biggest things that I hope in that context kind of helps those that may have it but not know yet or those that are getting just getting a diagnosis of it is having those experiences to pull from of like what should I be focused on then what should I be worried about you know they're telling me all of these things yes what do I do? <laughs> yes and it is something that uh, really concern the parents I think like you go to the doctor and the doctor is all the information and the parents like oh my god and now what she's going to have yeah <laughs> they don't um they don't see like they don't wait to see how the rose develops and what's going to manifest or not yeah yeah and particularly when you're diagnosed in utero it's even harder to make predictions about what's going to happen and you even more have to have really good understanding of what's going on at that moment and getting all of that information thrown at you is just it's a lot i can't i can imagine like i imagine that being diagnosed in uterus is harder than after it I think particularly because of the more unknown factor, that's what emotionally makes it difficult. My mom makes the joke. So I was her only baby she had an epidural with. I'm like, oh, so I was your easiest. And she's like, physically, you made up for <laughs> all those stress. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> because while the physical side may have been easier, emotionally that's such a roller coaster to ride to not know what's going to happen at any moment and them telling you this is a scary situation that is very volatile and we don't know what's going to happen yes uh, i think that like if i diagnose after birth like you the the grow is a red there so I think it, it is easier than when it, it, the baby is not born and you know, what should I expect? I think it's difficult. Yeah. So have you found in your research any particular things within the community, like the interaction between us that have it? Um, what I discovered is like um, many parents, they like to interact with each other. They made in a major way, they go to the platform to interact, to make questions because they have so many doubts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are willing to share their kids' experience to like, she's going to be okay. And, yeah. and um between the patients of Turner syndrome, I see that they all they also try to understand better the the Turner the Turner syndrome aspect, and also they want to find a community. It was like a feeling of not being alone in the world. I think this is the main aspect why people go to the internet, go to Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and share their stories and ask questions. Yeah. For me, I noticed that was a huge difference 
when before I started sharing and talking to others online versus after, I didn't even realize I was missing that part of community. And I think a lot of other girls and women want that too, where it's just like you fully and completely, not just partially, not just can imagine it, but you know what I'm experiencing also. Yes, and it's so amazing to talk with other girls that feels the same as you. And I think that this feeling of uh, have another person on the other side that understands you, it's something that makes a difference. And, um, and another thing that uh, I think that I, it, it is like a hypothesis that I am working on is like uh, these people go to the digital platform. We go to digital platforms because sometimes we feel like Turner syndrome is kind of invisible. Mm -hmm. So it is a way of uh, make things more visible, like uh, your feelings, your characteristics, your fears. I feel that. I can say that I feel I felt that too, because if you look at me, I am just short. Nobody knows that if you saw me on the street, you are not going to tell I have certain syndrome. So sometimes can be invisible. Yeah, I, that is so true. Just looking to be seen. Yes. And, and have that acknowledged and... Um, yeah, that's, that's very true. And I think the impact that has, I don't think you realize it until after the difference it makes. For sure. Yeah. But I, I believe that the most difference is like the social construction of Turner syndrome. This is one thing that it's the, the thing that I am really deep uh, really willing on on my research because i believe that sometimes people think that turner syndrome is an individual thing and when you go online this construction is social it is something that you do with other people so turner syndrome is not just what you think it is it is what you think and the experiences that you read. So you change the way you understand Turner syndrome reading other stories. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's it's amazing how adding up all of those stories just gives you, it, it's such a big difference in your perspective and understanding on it. Um, I think I've had a couple of moments over the life of my channel of having like my mind just short circuit on the amount of information I was processing and like, that is not what I thought. <laughs> yes. And having my mind changed or having my perspective and understanding just significantly changed. Yes, it is like that. Uh, we change our mind. It's a shift of mindset when you start adding stories to your experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. I'm so <laughs> excited for that. That's so amazing. And I'm so excited for your PhD. That's so awesome. So how long have you been working on your PhD? Um, this is the third year I am working on it and I am I want to finish it next year. It is my objective, but I can finish in 2023. It is like uh, it is when my when I have to rent it, to hand in my complete research. Okay. Very cool. That's awesome. Okay. Thanks. So is there um, anything else in particular that you wanted to share that we haven't touched on? Uh, I just want to say for everybody that is watching, like 
Turner syndrome can be scary, but it's not like a monster. It's not something terrible to that to deal with. Like if you have Turner syndrome, you, you know you have to know that you can achieve whatever you want. You can do where, whatever you you want to do. And for parents, I want to say that raise your kids the best you can. Give love and show them all the possibilities of the world. I think it's this. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for talking with me and sharing everything. Um, this was so great and so much fun. And I wish you luck on your PhD and everything. And I'm really excited to see how your research continues. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Brooke, for having me. It was a blast to talk with you. I had so much fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.